Yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Gabor Pertik. I'm one of the programmers here uh, for the Reykjavik Film Festival. Um, and it's with great pleasure that I'm here to be able to moderate this case study of two uh, terrific films here, uh, The Swan and Mikkel. Um, beyond the films themselves, of course, we're going to talk about the process of collaboration and co-productions uh, between uh, Iceland and Estonia and to kind of get into the details of how processes uh, like this work. Uh, before we get started, we have a nice full panel, as you can see uh, here. And uh, before uh, we get into it, I'd just kind of like to go all the way down uh, the list, starting at the end. If you could just introduce yourselves and say which film you're working with and uh, what kind of, uh, which part of the production you were involved with. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Hlín Jóhannesdóttir. Uh, we, uh, Birgitta and I had a company together with these pictures and we did this one. Uh, and Copley Kino Company was our co-producer from Estonia and we did all the shooting in Iceland and it's like an Icelandic project so we were delegate producer on that. Um, yes, uh, anything else? <laughs> no, that's uh, great, yeah, go. <laughs> yes, uh, um, of course, Birgitta Birtir, also the, one of the producers of this one. I'm Ása Helga Hjöllustóttir, the director of this one, and the writer. Evelyn <laughs> Bentira, <laughs> co-producer of Mikkel. And I'm Ari Alessandri, director of Mikkel. I'm Rina Sildas, I'm a co-producer on uh, Mikkel. And uh, I'm Kristin Thordarsson, a uh, producer on Mikkel as well. And it was actually very, the, 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 the film takes place in Estonia, so, so it, it was a really um, um, sort of an obvious collaboration um, for the film. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you all uh, for being here. Um, the next uh, phase that we're going to do is just show a bit of uh, trailers from each of the films in case you haven't had an opportunity to see it to give you guys all a little taste. So I think the first trailer we're going to show is uh, this one. We'll queue up the trailer for Mikael. 
Kafari fann lík Karlmanns við bryggju í Neskupstaði í morgun þegar verið var að aðtúa skemmtir á bryggjunni. Tilvilinn verðist hafa ráði því að líkið fannst hér um ellefuleiti í morgun. Eftir því sem næst verður komist hefur Láruglan aldrei áður haft undir höndum þekkjanlegt lík sem engin veit hver er og engin saknar. Mynd af manninu sem fannst látin í Neskupstaði fyrir að það hefur verið drift til akkur að Láruglustöfa. Ég veit það ekki. Það er tómt að denni, sko. Það er hinn og finna mannin. Ég er ekki að fara að bíða til löggunni, sko. No, 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 English, please. Your friend is not here, okay? We're too late. It's coming with the bus. On the field. Back to the city. Þetta er prent á sig í bóð. Þú er búin að stútfylla hana af ógeðslegum helginlíti sútlæmi. Fengar þetta ekki neitt, sko. Hann er þetta ólegt kallum. Bóbó, ég ætla ekki að láta ræna mig sér. One more word out of your mouth, I will slice your throat. Thank you so much. Um, so as we uh, kind of get into it, I think the first thing uh, that's best to do is kind of start right at the beginning of both of these projects in terms of kind of how uh, and why these projects came to be and then we'll kind of evolve into co-production and festival circuit aspects. But um, yeah, with that, I, I want to start uh, with the Swan uh, team. Uh, what was it particularly about kind of these stories and uh, these themes that really kind of drew you into making the film uh, that you ended up making? Um, well, The Swan uh, is based on a book, a novel, uh, based, uh, also called The Swan by Guðbjörg Guðbjörgsson. And the book had had a really profound effect on me when I read it. And um, so when I was later, in, I read it early, and before going to film school. And then when I was in film school and I took a class in adaptation, um, I decided to try to adapt this book into a into a film and it was certainly not without challenges because it's really one long interior monologue of this nine-year-old girl who is telling a story that she sort of doesn't under understand. Uh, she sort of se senses it more than she understands it intellectually and uh, there was just something, uh, there are many, many things I like in terms of the themes that drew me to it. I think that, you know, it's a deeply sort of existentialist work and that it's about just um, the human condition and what it means to be, what it means to be a human, and what um, and what I loved about it, and what I wanted to stay true to in my film adaptation is that nobody is simple. Nobody is just one thing. You know, every, everybody has um, everybody's sort of part devil, part angel in a way, and you maybe you need both of those sides to survive in this world. And 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 so and so it's sort of a coming of age film. That's the that's the label of it, but it's also so much more. And um, I mean, this the story is, and so the other, I could I could I could like use a full hour just to tell you why I was drawn to the project, but I'm not I'm not going to do that. Um, yeah. So then, what when I was when I started writing it um, as a school project, I soon realized that this was no ordinary school project. That I, that at least my interest in it was becoming much more. And, and I really wanted to do this for real, and yeah. And so then I brought the project to um, to Lean and eventually Birgitta, who joined uh, Lean in it later. And yeah, and and that was. It took, I mean, obviously it's my first feature film, so it took a while to get it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, do you wanna 
Elaborate on that. Elaborate on that. About <laughs> do, do, do you want to go into the co, <laughs> no, no, the yeah, no. co production part of it? No, was uh, that later? We, we can, yeah. Uh, we'll later on. Keep, keep going yeah. with the, yeah, the origins and then we'll try to. I mean, we did a short film with her, produced that, and we worked well together, and then we read The Swan, really wanted to be a part of it, and then decided to be on. So that's basically what happened in short. <laughs> well, it was obviously a project that we wanted to make a proper production, having made some more low-budget films, we were now entering into a more serious kind of production and we wanted to do this as a co-production, so that was uh, where we, maybe in, in terms of where we are in this conversation, we are, that's why we partly co-produced with Estonia, right. which was a, a nice thing to do. Well, that's great. Uh, and I think one of the most difficult things about kind of adapting uh, literature is you have to do your best to stay true to the author's intent, but also kind of delve into your own artistic vision, uh, which must be an incredibly hard balance to navigate. And just if you could elaborate a bit more kind of on that process, you know, you mentioned that this was your first feature despite having mm -hmm. worked you know, in films and you took a class in adaptation. But what was it like to be like, I need to pull it out, but kind of stay true to what's happening here? Yeah, that was sort of a, in the beginning it was, it was like, you know, you know, like a harmonica, like it went, it went back and forth from being very true to the novel to being totally different from the novel. And, and, and one thing I knew I did not want was this sort of film, you know, you, sometimes you watch film adaptations and you can just like hear the, the pages <laughs> turning and then it's this chapter and then it's, the, I really did not want that and I wanted it to be a movie and I, and I thought that while there were certainly um, challenges in terms of adapting it into a film because the main character also doesn't really have any of the typical plot points that or the the character sort of hero's journey points that that um that one is used to in many films um there were there were these little visual things that also i thought were very cinematic like how one like blood drop on a flower can say so much about the whole story or, um but yeah i mean i think that I, with Berko, the writer, he actually said when he first read the draft that one of the things, because there were other people that wanted to make a movie about this, but he said that one of the things he liked about my draft was that it was quite independent, that it was a film and not, um, and not so, so loyal to the book. Um, yeah, so, but it was, it was like a, it was a navigation. It was certainly a journey to find that point of, okay, now I'm happy with the balance of what's mine and what's, What's the, the heart of the book? That's great. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit to the Mikhail team. Uh, and yeah, if you all could kind of elaborate and go kind of into the, the roots uh, of this project and how it became to be the feature film, Mikhail. Thank you. <laughs> well, this, uh, I mean, I've been working on this project now for 14 years. But this uh, thing happened uh, in 2004 here in Iceland. And what I caught my interest is that I've been doing documentaries for almost 20 years, and I've done documentaries about social issues and mostly artists, though. And uh, <coughs> we had uh, been shooting a concert with uh, Björk in New York, and we did this uh, small piece of trailer of, of, of the film that I was doing at, at that time called Screaming Masterpiece. And we went to uh, this TV station, Channel 2, and then this whole thing had been happening when I was away. And uh, I met one of the, the, the main uh, guys in, 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 in this case. And uh, it kind of caught my attention is that uh, there are actually four. There are two, uh, in, originally they're from Lithuania. And, uh, they're <coughs> and uh, then there's those two Icelandic guys. And what caught my attention was that when you know, everything had gone wrong, that one of the Icelandic guys, he escaped to his mother in, in the east coast of, of the country. And that was something, because my interest has not been in, in those kind of a police drama stories. And uh, so I kind of looked into this and I was like, wow, this is something that I kind of recognize from my own family, because my younger brother had uh, major problems with drugs. And when he really got into trouble, that he escaped to my mom's place. <laughs> and that was kind of a, something that I kind of knew and also how <coughs> the people are portrayed in films and TV shows that you have the cop that is 
very good, but he has a little bit of problems at home or he has a drinking problem or something, and then you have those terrible people that are doing all the crimes. I mean, I have seen, you know, by, uh, and, and I know people that uh, have been involved in all, all sorts of, of crimes, and, and there's a, a little bit of, of this missing, uh, you know, this uh, human kind of a, a approach in, in those films, because it happens to be that they also have feelings, and like in this case, nobody wanted to kill this guy and chop him up and throw him into a plastic bag and, throw, uh, and dive him into a harbor. You know. So this whole case was also so strange because they found this uh, uh, because there is some sort of a ghost in this story, that uh, uh, and they have been they are very unlucky. First, uh, when he arrives, they were too late to the airport. So uh, where is he? He took the bus himself, and then when basically at uh, I mean that's not a big secret. Obviously the guy uh, guy he dies, and uh, the diver finds him you know uh, the day after that they, they, they threw him into to, to the harbor in this very little remote fishing place in, in the east coast. I mean how, I mean talking about bad luck as, as a criminal. I mean it's, uh, what is that? And so I mean you had mentioned you've been working in documentaries for the past couple decades now, and you know speaking of just adaptations in general, it's a completely different you know beast to tackle something in a fiction-esque realm or like a narrative feature and I'm just kind of curious in terms of your process of making that that switch or what was it that drew you to that? That was kind of interesting because uh, I mean we went through the script through you know rounds and rounds and rounds and uh, first I wanted to do this as a documentary. I, my plan was never to do this, this feature because doing a documentary is you, you get so involved and you get involved with people and real stories etc. And so what we did, we actually contacted the mother of, of because what, what I thought that was sad in the story is that they basically, you know, they cremated him and, and she got him by mail, basically. She asked uh, the Icelandic authorities that if she could get the body so that she could at least see her son for the last time before. For <coughs> so they said no to that uh, due to the cost of, of, of the thing. So, you know, she just got this jar. And, um, and earned with, uh, with the body. And I thought that it was so kind of uh, sad that, uh, that uh, I started to work on it. And then <clears throat> we had the script ready in 2007. We were really hoping to, to do it in 2008. And then we have this financial crash here. And you know, the, the project just kind of disappeared. And, uh, but I would say the difference between dealing with a documentary uh, and then uh, uh, fixing it was surprisingly so much easier than, uh, than I ever expected. Because also that, that we had been working for a very long time on it. That, uh, not that I had been a very you know, uh, detailed storyboard, but you know, the, the, the story was basically there. And uh, then when we got on it again in uh, 2012, because I had actually <coughs> met Evelyn in, uh, in um, 2011. 2011. And then we actually we had another project because I had a short film there <coughs> that was uh, conducted by, by, or it was a... It was a cool event actually. Yeah, it was, super uh, cool event. It was uh, <laughs> Tallinn. <laughs> Tallinn was a cultural capital of Europe in 2011. And uh, in December, sort of as a celebration for the end of the year of cultural capital, there was um, an event which was called 60 Seconds of uh, Solitude. No, sil yes. Solitude. Solitude. Yes. And uh, the basic idea of the event was to celebrate film art as such. So the organizers of the, of the 60 Seconds, basically they made uh, deals with directors from all around the world to make um, one minute short films, basically. Very short shorts. And, and all of these shorts were gathered together and they were printed on uh, film, real film. That's, That's, yeah, 2011, it still was a major <laughs> thing. Uh, and uh, it was shown once on this very, very super cold winter day in the Bay of Tallinn, and then it was burned. <laughs> yes, and there is a... Uh, there is that. That's how we met, basically, with Ari. He was he was one of the people who who sent in a short and who also came in. There were, but there were really also really famous directors. There was Naomi Kawase and there was Tom Tickler who were sending in material. So it was 
it was it was an interesting event and somehow I guess something happened. You started to like Estonia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect segue then, uh, <laughs> because of course now that we got kind of the genesis and the origins of these projects, uh, ideas and adaptations are one thing, but uh, co-productions become that much more uh, important uh, and evolving in terms of not only that kind of financing, but kind of cultural uh, connections to adapt and, and grow works. You see it more and more now throughout the festival circuit and in the film industry, and so we're here to discuss that a bit more um, in depth. And so we'll, we'll move back to the SWAN team in terms of uh, how did this kind of collaboration come to be and so, some of maybe the kind of benefits or difficulties that came uh, with it, the pros and cons. Well, we were at a Yava conference in May in Moscow. And we met a producer from Tallinn there, Anneli Aven, and we started talking. She had a project that she wanted to do in Iceland, perhaps. And then we started talking, and you know, she thought she might be able to do something for us, and we thought we, we might be able to do something for her. And so that how that came to be. And um, I mean, pros and cons. I mean, it's very. Uh, I feel that the Estonians are very Nordic in their thinking, mentality, mentality and thinking. So it was very easy to talk to her and um, and the people we, we got over to work on the film were very um, similar to Icelanders, so we didn't have any problems. Ish. And, uh, uh, I want to add, we had a very good contact and communications with the fans mm -hmm. as well. Right. They, yeah, were they were very, very involved. Yes, proactive yes. and, and yeah. in conversations with us. Mm -hmm. So yeah. When uh, a co-production comes on board, uh, and let's say in, in your experience, how much of their kind of input is on the creative sense? Or are they kind of backtracking and saying, this is your film, we'll just help and support? Or are they kind of overseeing and trying to tweak this process? Well, it depends on the project, I guess. I mean, of course, if you're just starting to work with somebody and the script is ready, they don't, they don't have any, feet, any say in yeah. the script or in the creative. But if you have worked with somebody for a while, then, you know, maybe. Well, also, yeah, when you need to, you know how this works, probably. I mean, you have to, you have some cards in your, mm. sort of, up your sleeve, and then you have to sort of distribute them evenly between the co-producers to make it work, to make it viable for everybody to be involved. So, yeah. I guess we just have to, you know, think of that, and, and what would be suitable going to Germany, and what would be suitable going to Estonia, and that's yeah. kind of how we did it. And then for the Mikkel team as well, you, I mean, you kind of mentioned the roots of being in Tallinn, but uh, going kind of beyond what, what was that collaboration process like in, in all your experiences? We actually well, we wanted to do a totally different film. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, we wanted to it's do true. this, yeah, we wanted to do this uh, short film that I, <coughs> that I did, and uh, <coughs> which is actually based on a story that is by the same author as, uh, as, as The Swan except that it's a story about uh, an old guy that is sit sitting with his urn, and he's, it's boiling water in the, in the story, and he drinks his wife, basically, and she appears to him when he is drinking her. That was actually the, the project that, that, that we wanted to do, and we will do it, but we had a kind of a, you know, uh, I got so much involved, uh, or I got so fascinated by, by Tallinn, and uh, I was so lucky that I got to, to meet Evelyn? But I, I have understood that there was also there was a role in the Icelandic uh, film center. Is it Icelandic film board? Film center. center. Film center. Film center. Yeah. Yes, that uh, Icelandic film center said that Ari, you have to now make. Yeah, because I, I we all, <laughs> because I had to basically thrown this film away in my in my yeah. in my head. And then I had uh, I applied to the film fund to, to write the script for this uh, this short film called Tour. So it's like I used the, this, the, the, the short film to use it as a teaser, how we could do it, etc. And uh, so I got support for the script from, from the, the fund, and then we were basically I wanted to apply for production of this other project. And then uh, Lev also pointed out that I had already gotten so much support for uh, Mikael and that we also had the media support for it, even that had been you know quite quite far away in time. So. Uh, it was, you know, it's like, what do you want to do? Don't you want to finish the thing that you, you already started? So, and, and then I started to talk to Evelyn again. Yeah, and then actually Mikkel was called Vaidas originally. <laughs> because, yeah, exactly, because it's actually happening with two Lithuanians originally. So I would say that the biggest challenge for us was to 
adapt the story to Estonia so that it would be feasible, viable and also best mm -hmm. for the film. Yeah. Was there any kind of concern in kind of shifting that story from inherently the Lithuanians to Estonia? Or? There's a very important um, shift actually, kind of mental shift between uh, Estonia and Lithuania. The Lithuanians are Catholic and the Estonians are Lutherans. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or non-believers more. Or non-believers, <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I mean, Ari, Ari can speak more, but uh, it actually proved to be quite challenging. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can imagine it just <laughs> becomes that much more complicated because you're dealing with such kind of pretty heavy issues here, <laughs> let's, let's be honest. But in, in transition, did you overall find it now that kind of the film is done that it, it at least does justice or service to both the original stories and to the stories you're trying to tell? Well, I would say that it's, uh, I'm very open-minded because I see filmmaking as this collaboration of, of, of many people that are involved. So, and I'm not, I mean, it's like when uh, I sent uh, Evelyn and Rina the script, they looked into it, they read through it, and then how are we going to adapt this thing? And they came up with a lot of comments also, it's like, because of this religious kind of a thing, and also it's like the script was basically too long, and uh, <clears throat> etc. So it's like we were, you know, going back and forth, and uh, I was very open-minded to that. And uh, yeah, we basically we we chopped down the script uh, quite a bit. But if to, yeah, if talking about um, <clears throat> co-productions and overall. Uh, I personally think that uh, the most, the biggest value is to work with people that uh, really bring uh, their best talent from their territory. So it, it really kind of is interesting to work because, yes, I can, act, uh, I can really admit that there are a lot of producers in Europe also that uh, bring the projects on the table, they are looking only for financing, and they don't have the you know, slightest idea what it means that if you are coming in with a certain budget and having a support from the fund side, that uh, you really have to bring on, you know, also creative input. And this is, uh, that usually is not thought through so much and that uh, later on may create uh, some, you know, kind of misunderstandings and, and also difficulties in production. But uh, from uh, this uh, side, uh, it was very interesting to work because we worked on the script, on the story, uh, because the story uh, is, uh, is very, very close to our source because uh, Baltic uh, countries, they have the similar history and uh, the same things happened in 90s and in 2000 in all the other countries and also this uh, tr uh, um, drug trafficking and we had the same similar <coughs> cases so we could understand immediately you know, that you know, the, the, the story could work also in Estonia. So this was only you know, adapting some cultural differences that are, that are slightly you know, um, between Estonia and uh, Lithuania different and uh, I think that we had really great work in yes. terms of our creative uh, uh, input also that I, I think is the only way to go produce and the interesting way. To and a really produce. big plus of course with this film like Rina already mentioned before I think or, or Christine uh, that uh, it was a natural co-production. There mm -hmm. needed to be a collaboration mm -hmm. anyway and uh, and of course the possibility for two kind of great young Estonian actors to participate in a, in a film like this it was it was a like really really it it turned I think the way how in a way yes Ari is saying we were doing it for 14 years or he was doing for 14 years I think we were doing maybe for five years <laughs> it's a long time mm -hmm. but uh, but at the same time I feel that uh, this time has paid off because uh, all of these breaks or actually not breaks but slow times contributed to the end result yeah. and I mean speaking of these points here for let's say someone that is an emerging or an aspiring filmmaker, uh, you know, who was perhaps seeking other forms of funding or collaboration or co-productions, it can be incredibly intimidating, you know, to try to put yourself out there to find who the right partners are. And I'm just kind of curious, maybe for both parties, what is it, what, what kind of advice or what, what's something that you would like to like give out in terms of who, how do you find a person that you can trust? What, what kind of questions do you ask? What do you seek out in a co-producer or a collaborator? <laughs> <laughs> a difficult question. 
It is a difficult question yes. because uh, each case is uh, different. Yeah, but I because you can also. maybe start. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I can I can also say that you know I remember one moment um, in particular sitting with Verena, uh, our German co-producer mm -hmm. um, of the Swan, and I was sitting in a room where she was pitching the Swan to a potential editor, mm -hmm. which had to be from Germany. Um, and I could just see her deep understanding and love for the project, and, um, mm. and I could see that she was going to make exactly the same film that I was going to make. Mm. And that was, you know, that's not all that common, and it's extremely important that you're, that you're both making the same film. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and, then, and, then, and then you just sort of start to trust that person, and then because it's also intimidating for a director to you know, just kind of be told, okay, you can choose between these here or four people that you've never met in your life. Go, you know, yeah, yeah. choose one and work with them <laughs> for the, like, you know, most intimate, or like for relationships like a cinematographer or editor, which is really, you know, like the core of the movie in a way. Um, so then, because that situation often happens, it's good to know that the producer is, the co-producer is someone that will, um, that will, have the best interest of yeah, the project. Best, yeah, have the best interest of and, and sort of promote, um, what's it called, um, promote people or um, suggest people that she thinks mm -hmm. understands the film also artistically and, and not just because of this m money, this arranged marriage, <laughs> you know, feeling, you know what I mean? I just, uh, you know, I, uh, I have, my, my mom is uh, Russian, Siberian. So I just called KGB and I asked, do you know Evelyn, Rina? <laughs> can you figure out who they are? Yeah, it's a good idea, by the way. <laughs> yeah, what do you think that? <laughs> so, uh, and they said, yeah, they're very nice, nice people. You know, work with them. Now, we just met and I think it's, uh, it's uh, you, you just feel it that it's, uh, uh, I saw what uh, they have been doing and then it was just a question of, you know, it's like, uh, the communication, and we really had a, 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 a good time in, um, in uh, Tallinn, and uh, then we actually we spent uh, New Year's Eve together in, uh, in, <laughs> in Paris, Paris. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it, it, it immediately we, we just became very good friends, and there was no, for me, there was, uh, I mean, it was more that, Evelyn, you, because we wanted to do this uh, film, Urna, and then it just is swap in between. She was not sure if she, she, she wanted to do it, and then she introduced me to Rina, so it's, uh, yeah, because the two Yeah, because we are, we are actually even more. I think I have never worked on a project that would have so many producers as on this one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There is also Friedrich Thor Friedrichsson yeah. from Iceland, and there is uh, Eil from Evil Dog. Eil Odekart yeah. from Norway. Yeah, from Norway. So it's kind of like, mm -hmm. it was a big, puzzle or big uh, big Greek family that somehow like tried to level each other out on certain moments but I guess we managed we are here <laughs> yeah. it, it mostly, I think it's also with co-productions it's um, um, you meet somebody and you sort of have to trust them and, and this you know you have to be able I think to start working together without signing the contract immediately mm -hmm. and it has to be you know you're sort of on the same page and I think you feel that almost immediately as soon as you meet somebody, whether you fit or not. And you just, you know, I think everybody should listen to their instincts with that, and, uh, and rather go with somebody that. I mean, for it's been very effortless uh, this production with us. I mean, it lent itself very well because we had to shoot in the Baltics and in Estonia. And I think in Estonia, it's our, our. I mean, I, I went there for the first time uh, when we were location scouting for this film, and, and uh, it felt very. Um, I, I, th I think uh, Estonians are very similar to Iceland or, or Scandinavians in that sense. I mean, the mentality is, is, is very similar. Um, and uh, it was it was great. Collaboration was great. I mean, like they said, I mean, we needed a lot of help with adapting the script to Estonia. And then bringing Norway in is uh, an old friend of Frederick Thor. And so that was fairly easy. And, and uh, they've, you know, they, they were in charge of the post-production sound. So, uh, so this whole collaboration worked really well for the project. But I mean, it becomes difficult when you want to go to a country and just try to get the money out. Of it. Right. The same, and that's pretty much it. But if you can, if it can benefit the project, I think that, that works the best. That's um, and before we open it up uh, to the floor for questions, and I do encourage anyone here, uh, if you do have questions, just get in on the conversation. But one thing I want to touch upon now, kind of we talked about the 
roots of the productions, the collaboration process, and now you know we are at a film festival here um, in Reykjavik, and both of you are kind of in separate stages in terms of your festival trajectories here. Uh, with The Swan, you've been on the festival circuit for uh, over a year with having your premiere um, in Toronto uh, the previous year, and I just kind of want to, you know, as you said, this is your first project here, so it can be an intimidating thing. I mean, there are countless film festivals in the entire world. Uh, and if you could just talk a bit about what that process is like in terms of who do you submit to, how do you submit to, and what, what is that film festival process like for you, and how's, how's it been now looking back a year uh, ago? Oh, so do you want to start? Uh, sure, I'll start. I mean, it was an emotional roller coaster last summer, you know, when we were submitting to um, festivals to put, put possible premiere festivals, A-list festival, a festivals, and, and we were you know, so close in certain cases and had even, all, had even sort of gotten a yes, kind of, from one, and then it was no, no room, and, and so it was like, you know, um, when the yes came from TIFF, it was really, it was like such a relief to begin with, just to, just to have that, okay, you know, thankfully it's, it's <laughs> getting, it's, it's getting, a, it's getting, and it, it's, you start to you start to feel like it's sort of your child that no one loves, or something. It, just, it starts to become like, who's gonna? Doesn't anybody want? Does anybody want him or her? And which is so crazy because it also, I mean, it's with all due respect to film festivals, and here we are. I mean, it's also just a film festival, and it's like the film. And it, when, once I was in um, Hamburg Film Fest, and this African director um, from. Anna, she said to me, you know, just, re just remember, like, you, the festivals need you more than you need them. And this is something that, you know, one often forgets maybe. And, I, and even though clearly we need them also, <laughs> we need the festivals just for the, I mean, because as, you know, you know, as everybody knows, it's like you, it's so hard to get that, to get the ball rolling um, for a film that otherwise nobody would maybe know about, you know, a film that's by a first-time director and, so th there are these practical, economical, and just industry reasons where you really uh, need need the festivals. But then um, it's also it's also good to sometimes think about it the other way around. Mm -hmm. That the film is something that will. And if if I think about my favorite films, I don't remember what festivals they premiere. I don't care. You know, it's it's just the. I don't. It's not the film is the thing that will live forever, hopefully, and and you know whatever whatever way it gets into the world. But then, but yeah, but then since then it's been, a, it's been really, it's been really a fascinating and tour of the world, you know, with the swan since I, then. I, th I think you're touching on something that comes up a lot, and I say this on the other end, you know, as, as a film festival programmer um, yeah. myself, is uh, especially in the last few years, you hear these kind of discussions of, are film festivals worth it? You know, we live in a digital age now, they're streaming, <laughs> everyone wants to go up on Netflix, you know, <laughs> iTunes, whatever it may be. But in this experience for you, uh, with your first film in this year, have you seen the benefits of film festivals? What, what, what have you kind of gained from it, other than, hey, you know, I, I get to be you know, here in front of an audience. Yes, what, what, what are the benefits say, of that? Film? Yeah, we've certainly seen the benefits, yeah. I mean, for me, the film is shown in countries that it might not have distribution in, mm -hmm. which is also, which is amazing. I mean, that's, to that's watch the film amazing. with, yeah, to watch the film in, Egypt or, or Japan, where it hasn't, doesn't have distribution yet, is amazing. Yeah, just opening up to new yes, audiences. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And when, you know, getting the, we got cinematic release in the US, which I think probably, maybe it wouldn't have happened if it hadn't already been mm -hmm. at TIFF and in mm -hmm. other festivals in the States. No, it's, I, a, it's, I don't a, chain know. it's, it's a chain it's effect. It's a chain effect. effect. Kind of thing. And, and yeah. It all matters a lot. And of course, in terms of reaching audience and, and just become, you know, get awareness, I mean, this is a crucial, crucial factor. So clearly with the sales agent, we create like a festival plan to make the, you know, outreach or what you want to call it, as much as possible and cover as much as possible. So, who, was, who was your sales agent? I'm a piece. Yeah, I'm okay. in Berlin. Yeah. Yeah. But I also want to add that I also think it's a really um, important point in time to talk about or to think about to sort of the ex now that nobody watches DVDs anymore, that they're just this accessibility of films, um, you know, saying things like the film is a thing that will last forever. Well, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, we have to be able to see it somewhere, and and so for art house films, um, 
I feel like it's in, we're in this transition phase now where, I mean, people aren't really making DVDs anymore. It's not worth it. And then, and then what? Like, how can people see the Swan, for example? It's true. Links expire. Yeah. 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 Um, speaking of new audiences, then uh, you're all about to go on your initial kind of festival journey here, uh, kicking off later this week in Busan. Um, yeah. And I've just been kind of curious in terms of your process now of like the starting of that trajectory and how has it been in terms of thinking and planning and uh, what your kind of expectations are in the circuit to come. Yeah. No, well, I think it's very important that uh, there's like uh, this film festival, the Rift, that we are here at now. It's like where people, you know, meet. I mean, this how this whole thing, uh, Michael, mm -hmm. came about is that mm -hmm. uh, Löwe, who's the head of the Icelandic Film Center, she introduced me to this guy called Stan, who was doing this thing in Tallinn, and that's how I, Stan thought, oh, I need uh, to find a producer for Ari. And so I met Evelyn in, uh, in, in Tallinn, and then from there it's like plop, 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 plop. And, uh, yes, but Stan, it, Stan was doing the 60 second thing yeah. in Tallinn, mm -hmm. yes. And Löwe introduced me to him here and we went out, we had several drinks and he says like, let's do it, you know. And that's how it's kind of a tuku tuku tuk, which is really nice, so it's so important. And this is also, it's like when I'm going to festivals, I meet people that uh, are of kind of a, my, my own planet, you know, in terms of, you know, interest and, and ideas, etc. But uh, what also was saying is like you look at this, uh, how stressing it is that you're coming up with a new film and who's going to take it, who's not going to take it. And I remember there's a very famous festival in, in the States that uh, I did a, a film on Yoko Ono and uh, uh, the film was rejected. And I fucking wrote the guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what an asshole he is. <laughs> I've seen a few of those <laughs> And, uh, but I just did it for, you know, it's like, it was not an angry, I was just like, I was uh, trying to understand why they would not uh, <laughs> like to have this extremely beautiful film about Yoko Ono and her Imagine Peace Tower, which is a piece here in, in Iceland. And I said, of course you don't have a, the, the final word was, like, of course uh, you're an uh, American, you don't, you, you, you just want to continue the war. Thank you, goodbye. <laughs> Well, good luck in Busan. <laughs> 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 Maybe they didn't get that email. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, luckily Busan is confirmed, so <laughs> they, they won't. <laughs> they won't call it off. Maybe. No, but it's uh, the, and then it come. You know, the, uh, regarding the other festivals, and then it's basically it's been the Icelandic Film Fund that uh, from our side that mm. has been sending you know links and mm. and introducing us to people. Sure, that yeah, I want to I want to second that thing about how important the festivals are about the personal connection. I mean, it really is. Speaking of what Kitty was saying about this instinct, going with your instinct, with how you, you know, connect to people, and if you would never, if, if we only lived in, a, you know, digital, you know, world of digital release all the time, this wouldn't happen. And you, I just came from Helsinki Film Festival last weekend, and and there I met a few people that um, I met somebody that had recently um, worked with a cinematographer that I'm thinking of maybe for my next film, and and, and it was just, and it was just so interesting to talk about. And I, and I could sort of get this personal insight into how she had experienced working with him, and and it was really, um, I mean, those kind of conversations. You, you you need to actually be there. You need to be at the restaurant. You need to be. You need to have the time to mingle, to just socialize, and and other. I mean, yeah. It's so. It's. I mean, it's very important. That there's a huge impact of sustaining. Yeah. The industry. I mean, this is cannot be overlooked, uh, mm -hmm. and cannot be a. Uh, it, it must be uh, kept alive, you know, yes. for that purpose. Yeah. And what purposes? Um, well, in this final little bit here, I do want to open it up if there are any questions. I don't want to kind of hog the microphone, unless we are a quiet bunch this afternoon. Mm -hmm. and we've discussed every possible thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, yeah, go ahead. Uh, th uh, thank you. I just uh, hope that there would have been more people here because I don't know a better advertisement for your films than, than this situation talking about it. See, I'm seeing these beautiful trailers because uh, sometimes the trailers give too much away, the whole story. But, but this raised questions and one uh, wants to see it with one's own eyes to, to, to complete the pu puzzle. Mm -hmm. So thank you for those. Um, you told us about these co-productions that you were all on the same page, but sometimes as a film critic, I do see that on TV productions and films that where many countries are involved, they might, the end product might be an 
unbalanced mix that uh, maybe they have had to use uh, the, the composer from that country and the actress from that country and and so on. Uh, and now the, you told me about the Helsinki Film Festival where I came also <laughs> some yeah, days okay, ago. Yeah. <laughs> so so um, and you uh, had in mind uh, some cinematographer. Uh, did you have to make on your films here, Mikkel and Swan, any compromises that no, I can't use this artistic <laughs> person or, or or somebody, or or did you just discuss about it and and get the end result that you were very happy with? <laughs> um, well, I'll start. Yeah, I mean, yes, there, some compromises had to be made, certainly, but I think that, um, and I, but I think that. I mean, there was also so much gained, and I, you know, for example, in um, we had this sound editor, Tina Andreas, on the Swan. That was in the beginning. You know, I don't think we. I, I don't actually think we were quite on the same page in the beginning, but then through through just talking about it, and I went to Tallinn, of course, many times, and um, we really started to sync up, and and I think, and she. Sort of because maybe because she felt like she didn't really know the because in my film there's like a heavy soundscape um, that's um, partly uh, nature sounds and partly man-made sort of drone-like sounds and um, all to create certain emotions and she and maybe because she didn't know Icelandic nature and that she really did a lot of research like so much research she's now, I think she's now the expert on bird, <laughs> bird sounds in Iceland, like probably the expert in Estonia for that. And, and she even knows all their Latin names and everything. And it was really... Um, that's, a, that's, that's a very good point because we were doing our sound in Norway and at one point the Norwegian sound, uh, sound person wrote us and asked about birds. Yeah. What yes. kind of birds? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, so um, it's an important, important thing. Yeah. <laughs> But, but I think that, you know, I think that it also, because um, you were saying that sometimes it ends up, you see these co production and it ends up with different results. At, at least in the case of the Swan, I mean, it was really heavy involvement of me, I mean, in, in all of these things. I mean, I, I, I think I joked to my, uh, to my boyfriend that I could we could probably like wallpaper our apartment with all the emails I sent to the, so to the sound designer because, because you're not there working together. So you have to communicate through email a lot and, and then go and do these intense things. and intense work sessions and um, and so th there's some maybe du you know double work or what mm -hmm. how do you say yeah. it involved and there's some maybe more call for like a um, artistic <coughs> overview but maybe that's also maybe that maybe I'm just that kind of director I don't know yet you know it's right you know it's like th that was how it was in this film and um, so so yeah it's pros and cons certainly but yeah. Compromises are never good. So uh, we actually uh, we had first we had a DOP that was supposed to shoot the film, actually a Norwegian guy who lives in Denmark. And then uh, he sent me an email several months earlier saying that he could not do it because he was going for with the film with Winterberg. And then we had a Norwegian guy who has actually been uh, shooting several of Fredrik Thor's films, uh, also the producer. And I have been knowing him through the years, and uh, then he kind of could make it, or his expectations were so high in terms of uh, I uh, by the script I was supposed to have 32 shooting days, but we had to cut it down to 25 due to um, you know, we were not getting the support from Euromas, etc. So it's like, how do we do it? And that is also very important uh, things that we talked about because we had to chop down the script, and that is where Evelyn and Rina came very strong into into this thing. How how do we do it without compromising, though? You know, and uh, so we had long discussions, and it's also it's uh, one of the best thing about it. It's also it's like. Uh, I was very occupied with the casting of the film. We really looked into all the actors in in, in Estonia. They say not all the actors. No, no, no. <laughs> the, the ones that, they, that, that uh, you kind of uh, uh, we, yes. we looked into a lot. We have more actors. In yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, uh, so we then this thing came up. So, uh, but, but I, I didn't finish the story about the DP. I actually, DOP. actually, the yeah. DP arrived in Iceland, and he had yeah. so strong health problems that. Uh, couldn't shoot the film, basically. Yeah, yeah. well, 
it was uh, so. But it ended up very well, actually. It ended up very, yeah. because I have this friend who's been doing some documentaries with me, and this is basically also his f first feature. Uh, so I said, I knew it, you know, it's, uh, you were there, uh, you were the man, and that's, that's how we did that. But then on the way, you know, uh, I actually, there's a small girl that uh, plays the daughter of uh, one of the main characters in the film. We had been going, and Leslie here in, in, in Iceland, uh, trying to, to find this girl because you, you could not be older than six. And uh, at the end, we had kind of a two girls that I kind of, they were acceptable, but not really there. And then uh, one of my main actors, uh, uh, he works in theater, he says, I have an amazing idea for this girl that is, she's only six. You should actually see her, you know. And this is just, you know, uh, what, two weeks before the shooting or something. And then I said, I met her, we did this test, I said, this is it, you know, it's her. And it was just totally my decision without, it's like I would not have to call Rina or Evelyn or Kitty and say, I really like this girl, is it okay? It's just, it was on the spot, we'll, we'll just do it. I, I, in a way, I think for us, uh, Ari kept on going about this luxury problem. That what? everything, it was called luxury problem. <laughs> it's even <laughs> quoted in the film. <laughs> luxury, guys, we have a luxury problem. <laughs> kind of, that they were good people that were presented to him that he liked and he had to choose from what is right for the movie. And, uh, Which is normal in co-productions because if you already are working with a co-producer then you kind of, or she or he brings the best talent from the yeah. territory and that's up to the director of course to decide whom to work with. So this is uh, ideally that and that's a question of matching because uh, what I wanted to point out that uh, these two films are debuts Mm -hmm. and, uh, and their co-productions, mm -hmm. which is quite rare, because usually uh, if uh, the director, uh, it's the director's first film, uh, there are not so many credits for the foreign funds to have trust or credibility in that. And either, you know, sometimes it happens that, you know, directors have films, their uh, short films in Cannes or Berlin, and then, yes, everybody's hunting for them. But uh, I want to point out really the, the trust from my standing film fund, the Student Film Institute also, that uh, they saw that there is a potential in these projects and uh, that it would work mm -hmm. out and it was, it's really huge success that they got financed from both sides and uh, that uh, they have a very nice uh, festival circulation also in both films and it worked out and uh, uh, you know, I've done a lot of co-productions in my life, but uh, this is, was really, we had the same kind of mentality, same kind of humor, which is very important. Uh, we drink the same drinks, because we're in the drinking <laughs> business. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's, and, uh, and also the management, you know, which is very, very similar if we are talking about co-producing with Africa or East Asia or, you know, Eastern countries, then, uh, then we can talk, you know, for hours. <laughs> Uh, but this was really very smooth, and uh, um, we can only say good words about that. Mm -hmm. So co-productions are very creative processes in themselves. Um, it's up to, can be, but can be also other stories, you know, it's, mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's all yeah. very, but it's always, uh, I'm teaching quite a lot also uh, producers, but it's always I'm telling that if you can uh, do the film by yourself, not going into co-production, do it. Never go into co-production because it creates, you know, it, but sometimes really um, the young directors are, or have visions to work with certain talent from the other territories. Yes, that's an, a very serious argument and then you start negotiations to get that talent from the other territory because it gives the extra value to the film. Yeah. I think that's, uh, as our time kind of comes to a close here, a, a bit of a wonderful note to end on, of clearly two success stories of these kind of collaborative uh, processes, and um, we can definitely keep the conversation going outside in the lobby, but before we wrap up, I just want to thank you all uh, for spending your afternoon here with us, and beyond that, to everyone here on stage, congratulations, and I know everyone here in the room wishes you luck with not only these films, but your future projects to come, so ladies and gentlemen, just a hand for everyone here on stage. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.